Hello, I'm Dallas Campbell, and in this series of videos, we're going to be showing you how to become a citizen scientist, how you can take part in real scientific experiments and help researchers make genuine discoveries about the world and the universe beyond. Well, today I have come to a rather damp breakers yard in southeast London to try and understand how dented cars can tell us all about warping in space and time to help me I'm joined by Andrew Davis from the Open University. Why on earth have you brought me here? So for my PhD project, I've been looking at warps, and warps are caused by mass in space-time. We're looking for arcs, which are warped distant galaxies, caused by the mass of a foreground galaxy warping or distorting the space-time to give rise to these images. So what's the link between that and, and say, a dent in a, a car door like this one? So car companies may use similar technology, artificial intelligence, to look for these warps or dents in the car body to try and infer the damage on the car based on those images and the warps they find. Okay, so uh, the AI will look at a car panel and go, oh look, there's a dent in it. But I can look around and use my eyes. I mean, I can see there's a great big dent in this car, for example. Could I look at your pictures from space and see warping of space-time? Yes, you can. So we have simulated images for the Euclid telescope, which you can actually see with your eyes, these arcs or distortions or warps in space-time. What's better, an AI, uh, machines or humans? This is exactly what the Citizen Science Project is trying to learn. We have AI technology which has already looked at these images and we have scores for them. Unfortunately, we, can't, we haven't got scores for humans. Well, our Citizen Scientist, Alice, is doing just this. She's looking at some of your images. Right now, I'm looking at a gravitational lens, which I found on Euclid Challenge the Machines. In the middle is a bright yellow core, a bit of an oval. Around that is a lovely ghostly bluish gray ring. Now, the reason that's formed is we've got a galaxy relatively close to us, like this, and behind it, we've got another galaxy. The light from this other galaxy behind us, it can't go through that yellow one in front, it's blocked. However, light can go sideways, it goes out in all directions. So it went out like this, then the gravity from this one pulled it in again, so it went like this. Now imagine it happening all around that, and that's what gives us this beautiful ring. It looks fantastic. So I'm trying to find anything that looks like this. It might not be the whole ring. If the galaxy wasn't completely lined up, then you'll just see a little arc or a little patch. You get to know after a while which is a lens and which isn't. Once you've got this data, once you understand it, what's the point of it? Why do you need to understand this in the first place? Well, the point of this is to learn why the machines are better and how we can improve them for future missions. So is this, is this more of a project about machine learning rather than astronomy? Uh, yes, yes. So we, we want the technology to be able to look, scan through millions and billions of images so that for future space missions, when we have all this data, we don't have to look through them painfully. So this whole project is about seeing what is best, computers versus humans. If you were a betting man and you weren't running this project, where would you put your money? My money would be on the machines to outperform really? the humans. Have you, have you met Alice? She's good. She's working very hard. I'm going to put a tenner on Alice. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dallas Campbell, and in this series of videos, we're going to be showing you how to become a citizen scientist, taking part in real scientific experiments and helping researchers make discoveries about the world and the universe beyond. And we're very lucky today uh, because we're going to be looking at how to detect cosmic particles with your mobile phone. I'm very lucky to be here with Dr. Joe Jarvis from the Open University and Dr. Alex, maybe a doctor. I mean... One day. Maybe. From the maybe. University of Life, mm. who's going to be our citizen scientist. Well, first of all, what is a, a cosmic ray? It sounds very esoteric. It sounds very science fiction. Mm. What are we talking about? They are a bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cosmic rays are really high energy particles um, that are raining down on our planet from space all the time. They're passing through us right, right now. Okay. Um, don't worry. So they're going through my... Yeah, okay. yep, yep. Don't worry. They're not doing any harm at all. But they are, they're not very big. No, they're not. No, they're, they're much, much smaller than sort of electrons and things that you might right. be more familiar with. Okay. But they carry huge amounts of energy with yeah. them. So th even though these particles are passing through me and tables and chairs and planets, 
how we detect them? Because presumably they're going through the phone itself. They are how going we, through the phone itself. How can yeah, we see absolutely. Them? But the CCD chip that is in there that you're actually taking your photo so on. So this is the from camera. the camera bit it's of the It's the phone. camera I bit, see. yeah, absolutely. That is, that's really quite dense. That's you know, a very solid piece of material. Yeah. So as the particles travel through that, they actually leave a little bit of energy behind. And we see that as, as an image, as you know, one, maybe two pixels lit up. So we're not seeing the, the particle itself. We're just seeing its sort of trail, exactly. if you like. How is a mobile phone going to pick them up? How are we going to detect these things? Well, first, what you need to do is pop an app on your phone, just okay. like any other app. And the, um, it's called the Credo Detector. Yeah. And it will be using the camera on the back of your phone, which you need to just cover up. What it is doing, I'll show some statistics. There we go. So you can see wow. the frames busy counting up. So that is constantly taking pictures. So, so this is a wow. visual thing. This is a visual. It's yeah, taking actual absolutely. snapshots. Alex, here is the phone. I want you to do a little bit of citizen science for me and see if you can um, detect a cosmic okay. ray. I shall start the detection. The go. How often are they hitting? Because a camera lens is very, very small. It is very small. Yeah, I guess a absolutely. Cosmic particle is also very, very it's small. also extremely small yeah so the the if you were to work out you know the statistics of you know a particle hitting your camera phone yeah. then it's really quite small but of course there are millions and millions of phones like this scattered across the planet and this is why it's a good citizen science project because everybody has a phone so everyone is carrying a particle detector yeah in, absolutely in their, in absolutely their we, we with, the with the help of citizen scientists we have got a detector the size of the planet. Dr. Alex, what have you detected? Have you come up with something? Oh, yes, that's quite a good two there. OK, so that looks to the untrained eye. That looks like two splodges. Yep, we've, two got, splodges. we've actually got but, two detections So those there, are two yeah. particles so two that, that have come in together. That have hit. And presumably all this data is going to be passed on to someone. So you yeah, know that absolutely. we've got two particles. Yeah. The question is, though, why do we care? I mean, why collect all this data? For, 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 which, for what purpose? They carry a huge amount of information for us. Um, so from a sort of scientist perspective, we can gather information about the Big Bang, yes. so where the universe and us originally came from. Uh, they can potentially help to answer some of the fundamental questions, such as dark matter that you might have heard of, mm -hmm. and what it is. But also, much, much closer to home, we're already aware of the fact we have to be a little bit cautious about what the sun is up to in terms of exposing astronauts to danger and affecting communication satellites, things like that. We haven't really looked at the effect of cosmic rays. Apart from now, Alex, I'm going to give you back this. C continue with your science. Joe, thank you very much indeed for that. There's also the Space Invaders app on there in case you want. I'm Dallas Campbell and in this series of videos we're going to be showing you how to become a citizen scientist, taking part in real scientific experiments, helping researchers make discoveries about the world and the universe beyond. And today we're going to be looking at how the human ability to be able to recognise and identify weird anomalies is going to help us find binary stars. And I'm very lucky to have two of Britain's finest scientific minds here, Professor Andrew Norton and Yo-Yo the Clown. Do you know much about binary stars, Yo-Yo? Is that your special? Oh, star, there's a star, single star. Okay, I have a star. Your star has vanished. And my, my star has become two stars. Andrew, is, is that a, a binary star? Exactly so, <laughs> thank you. We're used to seeing a single star in the sky, the yes. sun. Yeah. But at night time, many of the stars we see are actually two or more stars orbiting around each other. They're born at the same time. Like in Star Wars. Like, just like in Star Wars. And two stars may be going around each other. Now, to our human eyes, they're too close together. We can't see that it's two. But the light that we detect from these stars changes as one passes in front of the other. Okay. So why are we here on London Bridge okay. with 
Yo-Yo the very wonderful clown and his sponge. But what's clowning got to do with binary stars? So when, you can have... when we look at the light from these stars, we can train computers to spot these binary stars if they're behaving normally. Okay. And we can pick those out. But if one of them is behaving strangely, the computer wouldn't say, that's a strange binary star. It would just say, that's something peculiar that we can't understand. Same way we could train a computer program to pick out people, it might see Yo-Yo the Clown and say either, well, that's just an ordinary person, or it's not a person at all. Whereas we, with our human oh, understanding, yes. could say that's just an unusual human being. So computers are good, but they don't make any judgments. Exactly Whereas we so. can look at a clown and go, there's a man wearing funny shoes. What is it you want to do with a citizen science project? What's the kind of, okay. what's the plan? So we want people to identify these binary stars so actually for just us. sitting by down and looking with visually exactly. with their eyes. We have some patterns of how their brightness varies. Okay. And people can step through, look at hundreds of these and find the interesting ones. Exactly. Well, luckily enough, we have Alice, our citizen scientist, who is doing just that. She's actually looking at some photos of binary stars. We're looking at a sort of graph. It's a black background. It's got wonderful white speckles all over it in a sort of V-shaped pattern as if someone sprinkled flour over it. In the middle of all these white speckles is a red line. What we're hoping is that the white speckles and the red line will show as quite a regular pulsating series of V shapes. So this one is different from the other ones. This is called an eclipsing binary. This is two stars that are so close to each other they might even be exchanging material. They're going behind each other from our point of view very regularly. So, of course, sometimes we'll see the light from both and sometimes we'll see the light just from one of them. So she's looking here at patterns of how the brightness of stars vary with time. Okay. And she can pick out the ones that are binary stars. But what she'll also be able to do is pick out the unusual binary stars. They may have spots on one side, like Yo-Yo's tie, <laughs> or they've got a very bright patch on the other side, like his nose. <laughs> yeah. And picking those things out can help us find the unusual stars. And the human eye can pick those out better than a computer can. Is this project, is it an exercise in understanding more about binary stars, or is it an exercise at trying to work out whether AI is better than the human brain or vice versa? So in the first instance, this will help us find the binary stars yeah. because they're the only way we can directly measure the mass or the size of a star and so understand how they're born or evolve or die. And so we know how our sun then works. But moving forward, this will help us train computers better to recognize these strange things in the future. I gotta say, I don't think you're a strange thing at all. I think he's perfectly normal. I, I would look at I would look at you and go, nothing to see here. <laughs>
then if you were to be looking for these plastic bottles, but let's say there's a bunch of crisp packets nearby or something like that, you might get confused. You might not actually be able to tell the difference on first glance. For computers, which we would like to be able to process all the data, it can actually be quite difficult to tell the difference between one of the snippets or edges of a ring made by the muon um, versus one of the tracks made by the gamma ray. Well, we've, we've got our uh, citizen scientist, Alice, who is looking at some of these images now. I've got a grid of six by six dark blue circles. And in these dark blue circles, are lovely little splashes of every color of the rainbow. Some of them are slightly arc shaped, a little crescent, a little arc, sometimes even a little circle. And the rest are just sort of random cloudy bits. So here you can see almost a complete circle, but because it's so many different colors, that's going to be really tough for a machine to assess. But for us humans, it's pretty easy. The ones that are arcs or circles are muons, the heavy cousin of the electron. And it's fascinating to think of them flying across the universe and hitting our detectors and then appearing on my screen as these lovely little arcs. So you're going to generate all this data thanks to citizen scientists. What's the point? Why, why is studying gamma rays interesting? We want two things out of this. The first is we want um, to find a lot more rings, uh, and those rings we can use to actually calibrate the instruments. Um, but preferably, we would really like to tell the difference between the little bits of ring that masquerade as gamma rays, so we can clean those out of the system, and we can get a much better set of gamma rays that point back to interesting uh, astrophysical phenomena like um, supernova that are exploding or the jets of material that are spewing out of active galaxies, um, that sort of thing. Stuff that we like to study. Got it. Thank you so much. I've got to go outside and do a bit more litter picking now. There's lots of muons out there that need tidying up. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Have fun. Yeah, nice to meet you. Bye. Bye. There are loads more citizen science projects you can take part in, from penguin spotting in Antarctica to helping rescue teams target aid and resources during natural disasters. Find out more on the Citizen Science website. Get more from the Open University. Check out the links on screen now.